All right. So very good morning to you. And this is, this is our second uh, session uh, about the discussion of the conceptual thing that we see in the financial statements. And till now, we have discussed about the income statement. And now we are going to have discussion about the balance sheet. You can see that the, the name itself suggests that it's a statement of financial position of the business entity in, on a particular date. Uh, the business entity means the business existence. And the business exists if the company have assets more than the liabilities. So balance sheet is basically the proof that the company does exist. An existence, an existing company has a balance sheet where the assets are more than liabilities. And that shows that the company is solvent. We use this word solvent, as you can see. The solvent is something if a company's assets are more than liabilities. And the company become insolvent if the company's assets are below its liabilities. Okay. Um, as a rule of thumb, and I think I made that sketch also last week, that assets shows where money goes to or what the business own and the liabilities are where the resources or money coming from, or we can also call it what business owes to the other. And at any point of time, any point of time, not even an, um, an exception, not for a, not a short exception, the assets must be exceeding the liabilities. Or in the very rare situation, they can be equal to liabilities. Okay. Uh, in no situation, assets could go beyond, go be, uh, could, can go below the liabilities. I'll give you an example. If there is a firm whose total assets are 100 euros. It means that the company own 100 euros worth assets. And if the liabilities are 70, it means the company owes to the others equal to 70. Then 100 minus 70 is equal to 30. So the difference between assets and liabilities is 30. This 30 is equal to company's equity. This is company's capital. Uh, this is company's, uh, you know, the equity. Uh, this is the company's shareholders' worth. So imagine a situation that the company's assets are 100 and liabilities are 130. In that case, the company's shareholders' equity uh, becomes basically negative. And if the shareholders' equity or capital becomes negative, it means that the company has no right to exist. The company become insolvent. The company become bankrupt. Okay. So the balance sheet is showing. Uh, balance sheet is an existential proof of the firm. Any firm, see what, there's a difference. In the income statement, you have the profit and loss. You can be having losses, but you still exist because you can recover your losses in the future from the future profits. But you cannot afford to have liabilities exceeding the assets because the day it happens, the company collapses and then the company become, is declared bankrupt. Then it, the company is, is transferred to, the, to the, uh, the registrar of companies and then the bankruptcy procedure starts. We say the company become got bust or became bankrupt or insolvent. So it, the company can exist with losses in the income statement, but a company cannot exist for a moment if its liabilities are more than the assets, because in that case, shareholders value is negative. And when the shareholders value becomes negative, the company ceases to exist. So these, this concept is very important that this situation is permanent. So this assets more than liabilities. Uh, 
the balance sheet is prepared after incorporating. There is a procedure, there is a hierarchy. You always make the income statement first. And then you make the balance sheet. In the income statement, income statement, if you don't remember, and I can quickly have a recap, income statement is the first financial statement and it shows companies revenue expenses gains things which are more recurring nature more frequently uh, having and then we make the balance sheet and what is the relationship between income statement and the balance sheet if you have the profit then that profit adds to the company's capital and if you have the losses then that loss are making a hole are taking away uh, that resource in capital from the capital so imagine a situation that the company's equity is 20 and the company's profit is 10 and now the new capital would be 20 plus 10 equal to 30 because the income statement when you have the profits from there that adds to the company's capital. I can give you a small example with Excel. Imagine that when the year starts, imagine that when the, in the beginning of the year, Let's say the January 1, 2020. On January 1, 2020, uh, the company's total capital was 100 during the year the net profit which company earned from the income statement was 20 therefore the total capital of the company we can't see your screen. Okay, wait a sec, let me. Can you see now? Yes. Okay, I repeat the example. Let's say this is uh, January 1, 2020, last year. And on January uh, 1, 2020, the company's total capital was 100. And imagine that on that day, the assets were 500 and liabilities were 400. And the total capital is equal to Quickly remember what I said. Anybody knows what is total capital of the company if you know the assets and liabilities? Yeah, I think assets minus liabilities. Very good. So it's assets minus liabilities. And on that day, uh, for, I mean, for, for the uh, on that day, the company's profits were 20. So then during the whole year, and then the year closes December 31. 20, the total capital would jump to 120. It means that in one year's time, your total capital has increased to by 20% or from 100 to 120. And this addition is because you have made profit in the income statement. And just in case, 
you have not made profit but losses during the year in that case your capital will go down to 80 so basically uh, the addition or deletion to your total capital depends on whether you are earning income or you or you are incurring or facing losses in the income statement so this is quite a logic that the assets you have you have the liabilities the difference is the total capital and if there is any addition or deletion um, in the capital that must be because of the profits or losses if it is a profit there is an increase the capital increases and if there is a losses then the capital decreases so it's very important that you should be a company should be of course you can live with losses but you cannot sustain with losses because what will happen if you have lost in the first year lost in the second year third fourth fifth sixth seventh year what will happen there is a risk that this figure can become negative and eventually the company loses everything okay. so therefore um, losses can happen but you cannot sustain with the losses a company sooner or later have to find some way out to get rid of these mounting losses okay let me share this screen again capital is also called shareholders capital because it belongs to shareholders by the way uh, it is also called shareholders equity uh, it is also called equity capital uh, or net assets why we call them net assets because it's uh, excess of assets over liabilities or owners equity or shareholders net worth and many many more words but you can get a clue from the equity or the shareholders the word so so that is why uh, you don't have to memorize all these words because uh, the very important thing is that you should know that what word is your company using okay uh, for example my company which i'm using in this uh, course my example company is bp if i very quickly go through it uh, because i also have a snapshot of uh, they use the phrase uh, well, I'm showing only asset side, so I have to wait. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first, let's only focus on the assets. We can talk about the liabilities later. Uh, the assets. Is the resource uh, owned by the business? I think we discussed many times. The assets can be uh, of various types. They can be tangible. Tangible are the one which you can touch, like plant, machinery, equipment, furniture, fittings, fixtures, land, building, tools, books, computer. I mean, all these examples which you can, which have all the physical properties that there is a space, they have a weight, mass, all these things. Uh, you can see them, they are in the physical form. They can be small, big, but they're still uh, seeable. And then they are, another category of assets could be intangible. The intangible assets which are invisible, but at the same time, they are very valuable. Like the company's goodwill, the company's patents, the trademarks, the copyrights, the brand equity which you've been building over years, your designs sometimes, because if you are some kind of very, um, if you have some, if you make some designs, if you're an architecture company, then the design that you own uh, are very important. Basically everything which is intellectual property uh, are called in intangible assets. And if you see some IT firms, uh, if you choose to have Apple or Nokia or 
or, or, or this company, uh, Microsoft or Adobe, you'll find that they have a very big block of intangible assets. And if you have some consultancy company you pick up, you will see that their brand equity is huge. Okay. Uh, so these companies which involve a lot of uh, non-physical, uh, you know, this intellectual property, uh, they, they own uh, quite a big amount of intangible assets, okay? Uh, the assets can also be uh, classified as the current and the non-current. It's not can be. In I think in the 99.999 percentage of the balance sheet, which I have seen, uh, it's always classified as the current assets and the non-current assets. Okay. Uh, we know the definition of current assets, I hope, that those assets which mature within a year, uh, max 364 days, are called current, and anything which is 365 days or above, it could be 365 years, <laughs> they are called non-current assets. Okay, so it's very important that we we, we must know that uh, which are the current and the non-current assets. And also the assets can be fixed and non-fixed or the mobile assets. Um, you can say that then what is the difference between tangible and the uh, fixed assets? If you have a fleet of vehicles in your car in your company, uh, those assets are tangible, but they are non-fixed. The company, for example, Uber, or of course they are based in franchise, but if just in case, imagine that they own the cars, then they are non-fixed, but at the same time, they are tangible. On the other hand, the building, the building is tangible, but at the same time fixed. So we need to be very careful that when you talk about the assets, your main consideration should be current and the non-current, but within the current and non-current, you can see the these, these other categories also, fixed, non-fixed, and so on and so forth. I can quickly show you basically, because I have the, the screenshot of uh, BP. Um, not sure if you can see, but let me zoom in. I will not discuss yet each of them, but you can see that in case of uh, British Petroleum, uh, they have categorized, the broad categories are um, non-current assets and the current assets. And But within the non-current assets, uh, they have made the category of uh, property, plant and equipment, goodwill. You see, I, I told you the goodwill. Uh, Goodwill, um, do you know the meaning of goodwill? It's not a goodwill gesture. Any idea? What is goodwill? Goodwill is something. Um, it's something about the, it's something similar to the brand equity. If you start a business, you you buy a, you purchase a business for one million euros, and you stick with this business for two years. Maybe maybe it was a startup. You started it. Um, you started overall. You generated one million, and you started your business. And eventually, now it's time for you to sell it off. Okay, uh, then you demand some kind of premium from the next buyer. And you say that, hey, the total value of the business is 1 million, but uh, the company's reputation or the name that we have built in the market, because when I started, it, nobody knew it. But now people are aware of it. People know my firm. People know my reputation. So this name generation, this contact building, which I have done, uh, is worth uh, 0.3 million. So therefore, I will not demand 1 million from you. I will demand 1.3 million from you. And this addition, which you are asking, it's like a premium you're asking for, something you want to sell more expensive. That is called goodwill. 
And you can see that the goodwill which BP uh, has added is uh, uh, about uh, 11,000 something million. So it's about, I don't know whether it's 11 billion or something. So it's a big amount of money which they are demanding. That is called goodwill. Goodwill something the price for your reputation you build up. Goodwill can be negative also if the reputation goes down. Uh, then there is intangible assets. We just discussed about the intangible assets. Maybe they have some special designs, some special rights that only they can explore the uh, oil in certain parts of the Nordic uh, the Northern Sea. Uh, then investments, well, that we discussed. So in the joint ventures, associates, uh, and the other investments. And the next category you can see is the fixed assets, but they are still part of the non-current assets. Uh, because fixed assets usually last for more than a year. That is why they are included in the category of non-current assets. So eventually what happens? Uh, there is a loan, um, there is a trade and other receivable. I'll come to these things. And then we have the total of uh, assets. And then also there are non, uh, there are current assets also. So in this example, the point I'm trying to make is that, the point I'm trying to make is that the company uh, have two broad categories. You have the non-current assets and the current assets. The non-current assets can be fixed assets like these, and as well as some other additional assets also. Okay, uh, the company uh, has investment in the joint ventures. Of course, it's an asset. Uh, joint venture, I think I told you last week that uh, the company can have different type of investments in the form of joint ventures or associates or subsidiaries. Um, if it is about 50-50 kind of thing, then it's a joint venture. If it is a, you know, a, the, the proportion is not so high, then it's associate. Uh, but at the same time, if you are owning almost 100% of some company, um, then it's called a wholly owned subsidiary. So sub, in subsidiary, your investment is the highest. And these are the investments. So obviously, because these are BP's investments, the money goes out from BP's pocket. Hence, these are uh, BP's assets. Needless to say, these are going to last for more than a year. Thus, we also include them in the block of fixed assets. You can see here, all these assets are clubbed, added together in this category of uh, fixed assets. And then the company can have the loan, uh, you are giving to somebody, when you give a loan to somebody, when you take the loan, it's a liability, but when you give the loan, uh, it's be it become company's assets, uh, then trade and other receivable. Now, trade and other receivables, uh, the definition is given in the slides, the trade and other receivables may mean that BP's main trade is to sell oil. When BP is selling oil to the corporate clients, they don't pay the BP immediately. Of course, when you, when people like you, me, we are the retail, we are the, uh, the final end consumers of BP products. We use BP oil. We go to gas station, we swipe our card, we make the payment immediately, that's it. But if BP is selling the oil to some of chemical companies which use fertilizers or some other paints and chemicals, I'm sure they don't pay BP immediately, okay? Thus, BP has a claim on these companies. When you have a claim on somebody, that is also the asset. So you can see that this become companies uh, uh, trade and other receivables, 2147. The question is, why are they in this block of non-current assets? because BP knows that these people will not pay them be, uh, before one year. So it means these are those clients, 2147, who will pay to BP uh, on 60, 365th day or later, but not before that. But you can see the same word here, trade and other receivables in the current assets also. Now, what does it mean? These are those clients, 
who will pay to BP, but less than a year. Okay, so about twenty-four thousand four hundred and forty-two uh, million dollars worth customer. They haven't paid when they got the BPs uh, when they bought things from BP, but they will definitely pay within a year. But these are the trade and other receivables who bought things from BP, but they will not pay before one year. So be careful that the same asset can be in both blocks in the current and in, in the current as well as the non-current assets. Uh, derivatives, I will not tell yet because it's it's like a risk insurance thing, financial insurance. Prepayments, yes. Uh, the prepayments, I think we discussed about it last week also, that the prepayment is something which you pay in advance. When you pay something in advance, for example, this is the, let's take the example of rent. Uh, this is the month of January. In January, you also paid the rent of February and March. So in one month, you paid the rent of two more months. This is your claim on the landlord that, hey, I will not make you payment next week, next month because I paid you already, but I have the right to live in the apartment. So you live more rightfully. So it's more like your claim upon uh, the other company. So that is, the, that is called prepayment. But if you don't pay, if you don't pay, for example, uh, it's a February now, let's assume, and you haven't paid the rent of January to the landlord. That now, when you when it is February and you haven't paid the rent of January, it means what? It means that you owed some money to your landlord and you haven't paid it yet. Thus, you owe the money to the, to the landlord. When you owe to him or her, it becomes your liability. But when you make the advance payment of rent, then you own the right, you own the claim to be in that apartment in the future as well. Then it becomes the asset prepayment. And here you can see that the prepayments of BP are in the current and the non-current period. It means the BP has made some payments uh, whose benefit uh, BP will uh, achieve even beyond a year. So the BP hasn't got those benefits yet, but it would have, but the payment has been made already. But same way, the prepayment can also be here. These are the payments made by BP in advance to its service providers, maybe some IT company who, which provides, uh, it's, it's like uh, the system. Uh, but this, this prepayment, the BP would get the service uh, within a year. So it's a current asset. Uh, deferred tax assets. Deferred means delayed tax assets. Uh, this is something which it could be possible that the tax man owes to the BP. In other words, uh, BP might have paid some advance to as a form of tax to the tax authorities. Or it could be possible that BP has the tax credits in the past. Remember, you all also get the tax credits, certain benefits from the tax authorities. The BP has got the tax credits and BP has not used them yet. Like it could be possible that in the last four or five years, a uh, tax man has told BP that, hey, you bought this thing, you did this thing, we give you some tax refund, we can give you tax coupons or vouchers, and you can use them whenever you want. And BP is just adding them up and not uh, using them, okay? It's like you get some gift hamper and you haven't used it yet. And some other things. So I, I will not go in each of them in details, but there can be many types of assets they can be fixed assets, uh, but fixed assets are within the uh, category of non-current assets. And then there can be current assets. And some, some things can be in both. Like for example, uh, prepayments were in both, mm -hmm. here and here. Uh, loans were in both. Here, BP has given loan to some companies and they will pay back after one year because it 
falls in the category of non-current assets. But here, BP has given loans, but this is in the current assets. It means people who owe this money to BP, uh, they must pay within a year. So these are the different items in the uh, asset side, but of course I will discuss them in the slide also. Uh, Chad, can I have a question? Um, by fixed asset, we mean the name says fixed. They never move, yeah, right? Yep. Um, the opposite of fixed asset would be mobile assets or the non-fixed assets, which you can move, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So let, let, let's imagine that you have some, um, a company like BP has a lot of automobiles the big trucks, the big lorries, which carry the oil and to the gas station and so on and so forth. Now that is not fixed. Mm -hmm. We all agree, hopefully, that the vehicles move. So they're not fixed. They keep moving from a place to another place. But at the same time, uh, the benefit of the lorry or the trucks are beyond one year. So the non-current assets can also be non-fixed assets. But on the other hand, the building, uh, the building is a fixed thing and its benefit will also be more than a year. But loan, for example, a loan is not, you can't call it fixed, even though the loan is given for more than a year, but loan is not a fixed asset like building or the property. Somebody buys goods from BP and has not paid yet. And he will not even pay uh, be before one year. It cannot be called a fixed asset because it, fixed means there is a structure, they're tangible. Yeah? I, are you getting the idea or not? Uh, yes, yes. When I, when I say the word fixed, fixed means the fixed, like, like in the physical sense of fixed, building, it doesn't move. For example, in the building, uh, let me give you an example. In Yamk, we have a building and we have the furniture. Even the furniture will last beyond a year, but I can't call the furniture as fixed asset because it's movable, basically, isn't? Yeah. But we can't we can't move a room. <laughs> we can't move C one one three to D one one four. You have the projectors, they are movable. You have the computers and all these things which I'm naming, they are they can last beyond a year. So there are many movable things. They are non-current, but they're not they are not fixed assets. But on the other hand, there are certain things which are fixed, like the, the building structure itself. Usually uh, the fixed assets are uh, which last, uh, ah, sorry, which are, I think the land and the building are the most prominent uh, fixed assets. Similarly, uh, there are some, we use some tools and some of the machineries are very heavy. You can't move them. Once you install them, they are rarely moved from it. If you see the factory type of uh, uh, layout of a company, you see that once you fix the machine, the big heavy machine, some plant, uh, rarely you move them. But if you have the screwdriver, if you have a wrench, if you have the hammers, they are also equipment, mm -hmm. but you can move them whenever you want. <laughs> even though even the hammer, even the screwdriver have a life more than a year, they can have, of course. But then we, call, we can't call them, we can call them non-current assets, but we can't call them as a fixed asset because they're mobile in nature. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So we categorize the assets, but usually, uh, okay. 
and then um, in fact we have done already uh, the current assets uh, that are expected to be sold or consumed or utilized or they would exhaust within 12 months and generally the current assets include cash you know the cash we all know what is cash and then we also include the cash equivalents we have the inventory accounts receivables uh, some marketable securities uh, the prepaid expense the prepayment and the other liquid assets so these are generally and you have seen that uh, almost same things were in the bp's case also but before i go to the next slide i want to ask you something what do you mean by cash equivalents what do you think cash is clear uh, what do you think is cash equivalents bonds hmm? maybe government bonds i don't know yeah why did you call them cash equivalents because mm, uh, you can receive from them some cash but yeah. it's kind of active like you can do it whenever you want so mm -hmm. like it's equivalent but you can you can convert it yes very good very well said the this the securities the certificates which are issued by the state the treasury bill the treasury bond uh because you know that the we invest in some uh, in the government's stock uh, the, the government securities also these securities which are issued by the government they have a one very good quality the quality is that they are very easily convertible to cash without any big problem because cash is issued by the state and these securities are also issued by the state the only thing is that they look different. Here you have the, for example, paper notes, and here you have some kind of bills, some treasury bill or something. So you might have some uh, assets, which are, even though they don't look in the form of cash, but you can, if you want, if you need, you can very quickly uh, convert them to cash without any problem and without any loss because the, it's already decided. For example, if I, okay, if I have 200 euros in my pocket, the 100 euros is, is cash, but I spend, I buy uh, the Bank of Finland's uh, papers with 100 euros. And the Bank of Finland promises me that it will give me 2% rate of interest after one year. But if I need cash, I can just sell them very quickly back to Bank of Finland and get my 100 euros back straight away in my bank account where I already have 100 euros. And without any problem, my bank account will again be 200. So the cash equivalents are those which are not cash, but they're almost nothing stops them from being called cash because they are so quickly and so easily convertible into cash. Mm -hmm. So the, the word equivalents come because the ease of converting them back to cash but look at this third one inventory inventory includes basically three things this includes the if you see the factory like situation you will see that there are three types of inventory the one is raw material totally raw material so if you are making furniture, then wood stock uh, can be the raw material. Um, if you are a engineering company, heavy metal uh, based engineering, then the, the metals, the raw metals, the iron, the aluminum, the, the brass, all those metals which you keep in your warehouse is raw material. And then the second part of inventory is the semi-processed goods the goods which are partially ready but they're not fully complete yet to be sold and third is called the finished product the finished product is that which is totally ready to be sold just some polishing is needed some packing is needed um, and 
it's still in the warehouse but not in the showroom okay um, that is called inventory but i want you to see one thing inventory and the cash equivalents can you compare them both is there any comparison between the two well the comparison is that the cash equivalents are very quickly and without any problem without any hitch they are convertible to cash but look at the inventory if you have huge amount of raw material in your warehouse and suddenly you need cash what would you do would you sell it again in the market who will buy from you it's not easy to buy from you because if if i need any raw material to buy i will not buy from some other company i'll buy from the inventory selling company okay so the ease here the cash equivalents is so quickly convertible to cash and here inventory the only time i can convert inventory to cash is to make a final product sell to the customer and then get the money so here the conversion of inventory to cash may take a lot of time but here it it takes a few minutes mm -hmm. and then we have the accounts receivables the accounts receivable is that um let's let me give you an example of accounts receivable in excel mm. okay i hope you can see the excel spreadsheet let's say the company is taking selling total sales is 1000 1, and the cash sales are 700 then the credit sales would be equal to Three hundred, but the these people, the credit sales. This can also be called as my. Uh, this can also be called as my accounts receivables. Why I call them, or I I can also call them as my trade receivables. Trade. Because these are the people who I sold something. I provided them the service, but they haven't made me the payment yet. Not that they have run away with the money, they are not going to pay me. They will pay me. But it's a very routine thing that if you have the, usually if you have the B2C uh, transactions, it's very, it can be cash based, but usually the B2B customer uh, sales are very much on the credit. Uh, basis so it's a quite a routine thing that people don't pay you on the spot on on the time of transaction but on the later day and because it is a transaction uh, about your main trade activities therefore you call them as trade or accounts receivable can i call them loan for example can i also call them loans not mm -hmm. can i call it loan yes or no kind of yes maybe Yes, uh, you call it loan. Uh, can you explain why we call it loan? Um, I think it can be called loan because 
we kind of give money to the other company or to the customer, whoever, and they have to pay us, pay us this money back, but they didn't do it yet. So it's similar to loan, I think. Um, if you, uh, for example, if you, if you, for example, buy a car, if you buy a car, for thousand euros and you pay them cash 700 do you think that the car selling company has given you a loan basically mm, something like this <laughs> <laughs> no we, we will not call it loan uh, because I hope you remember that when we were discussing last week, we were discussing that we, if, if BP, has sold its goods to the customers and the customers have not paid it yet, BP's job or the BP's main business is to sell oil, not to give anybody loan. BP is not a bank, by the way. So if the BP is selling something and the customers have not paid yet, it's a business transaction, but the company, the, the other party has not paid it yet. It's not loan. The loan is that if this, if the BP is giving some loan, means the other company has borrowed from it. Borrowing and purchase is different. Do you get my point? Uh, if you, if you are my client, I sell something to you, and you haven't paid me yet. I can't call it a loan. This is you are my accounts or trade receivable. You owe me money but that is about on account of my trade activities, my, my business activities. But if you also approach me someday and ask, Shab, I, we have the business relationship. Um, I'm your buyer, you sell me goods. Uh, and you're so nice that you also sometimes allow me to buy goods on credit. Uh, if I buy something, I, buy, I give you some cash, but sometimes you'd let me buy without cash and I pay you later, later on. We have a good business relationship. I'm in a crisis, I need something. Could you lend me a thousand euros? Now, please tell me, if I give you 1,000 euros, will it be because that I've sold something to you? Mm -hmm. Or are you asking me for some kind of help or some accommodation or something? It was like help. Help. Then I call it loan. It's difficult to call even help because you pay me interest. You say that, okay, fine. Uh, can you lend me thousand euros? I'll pay you interest. Yeah. But this business relationship is not same as this one. Here, we have purely a trading relationship. I sell something to you, you pay me some cash, remaining you pay me later on. But then on the other uh, uh, occasion, you ask me for some loan that, Shab, I need some money, I need to do something. If I go to the bank, it might take me longer because banks follow some procedure. I need the immediate loan. Can you lend me 1,000 euros? But I will pay you the interest or no interest. But definitely, um, loan means that you take money from me and return it. It's not something that I'm doing a favor that I give you thousand and never ask for it. Of course, you would give it back to me. That is why the loan, I call it loan because you will eventually return it to me. But this business relationship is not same as this one, yeah? So therefore, this accounting, this trading relationship uh, cannot be called as a loan. So therefore, if I can quickly show you again the balance sheet, uh, of BP 
you will see that it looks like uh, it looks like, for example, this one. It means that there are some companies to whom BP just see the cursor where it is. There are many companies to whom BP has sold goods, but they haven't paid to BP yet. But there are some companies to whom BP has also given loan. So there's a difference in the loan and the trade and other receivables. Yeah. So loan is because of your business. You know somebody because when you are in the business, you start having some relationship. Uh, but you can also have trading relationship and you can also have the non-trading relationship. Uh, trading relationship is that you sell something and they pay you. Sometimes they pay you later. But the non-trading relationship can also be that you, they can also seek some help from you and you give them help if you can. And if the help is, depending upon the help, uh, is loan a help? Yes, it is a help. But for the loan, the money has to come back. But for example, if you approach some government organization uh, uh, and you need some, for example, you want to do some research and you approach some uh, funding organization, they can give you grants. The grants are usually not returned but no private company will give you grants. The grants is something which you get, but never return. Uh, loan is something you get and you return, basically. Uh, in the private business relationship, these are loans. Grants, I don't remember that BP would give money to its uh, business partners and they never give it back, it, it rarely happens. All right, but these terms would be more uh, clear as you start exploring them more and more. The non, uh, yeah, and then the other form of current assets could be marketable securities. The marketable securities are like, for example, if you buy some shares or some uh, non-government, not the government ones, the government, uh, non-government uh, bonds you buy uh, and you sell them in the market. For example, uh, if I'm representing BP, uh, if I also, because companies also invest in other companies. So if BP has bought shares of Shell uh, and then it sells the shares, uh, then this is called a marketable securities. So BP can also own the shares of Shell, Total, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, in Finland, this is a very common practice that the companies buy each other's shares. So if you look at Nokia, uh, Finnair has bought a lot of shares of Nokia. So, but that is marketable. If Finnair uh, wants to sell them, uh, then of course it can sell them. And then prepaid expenses, we also discussed that when you have paid rent or something in advance, and the other liquid assets, there can be some other forms of liquid assets also, which are easily convertible to cash. So you can see that uh, the assets could be current and non-current, okay? Uh, usually the non-current assets I showed you uh, are fixed assets, uh, but they can also be the non-fixed assets. If you have a building, it's a fixed asset, but if you give a loan to somebody and that somebody will give this money back after a year or two years or three years, uh, that is a fixed, uh, that is a non-current assets, but not a fixed asset because fixed mean it's like, a, it's more tangible like in the physical form. Okay. Right. And then we have the liabilities. So basically liability um, and the asset, the only difference between the two is the approach that in the assets, we claim that you own something. But in liability, we don't use the word own, we replace N with E 
and we call that you owe something. Okay, so when BP, uh, when BP was selling something to its customer, and the customers were not paying it yet, it's a claim of BP on its customer. Thus, it was a BP's asset. But if BP is buying something from its supplier, and BP has not paid them yet then it become BP's uh, liability, okay? Similarly, uh, when BP is borrowing some money from the banks or the people uh, loan, then BP has to give it back. So it's a liability of BP, okay? So the BP um, or, or the company also have the liabilities and the assets, but the key thing is that uh, these assets and liabilities are, I mean, these liabilities can also be in the category of uh, uh, the current liabilities as well as the non-current liabilities. Let me see if I have an example of liabilities. Uh, do I? No, but I can quickly check in the, if I open the, Wait a sec, I can show you how the liability look like. I, why didn't I take a snapshot of this? I could have taken a screenshot of this also, but I'll do it, no worries. If I go to BP's uh, annual report once again, and I check the balance sheet, which is not far away. Um, Consolidated financial statements. Yeah, I'm here, right here. Yeah, so just a sec, I zoom in first and then I share with you. Uh, <clears throat> okay. And now I can share with you. Once again, we stick to BP. Uh, you can see that the BP has its current liabilities here. And these are the trade and other payables. Like, like, like BP has its receivables, uh, BP also has its payables. Payables means, uh, these are the trade payables. Look at the word trade payables, that BP bought something from its supplier and hasn't paid them yet. And because it's a current liability, it means that the BP must pay them within a year. Haven't paid them yet, but BP must pay them uh, within a year because it's a current liability. But does trade and other payables are also in the non-current liabilities? No, there are no trade payables, but something else, maybe some other payment, but not trade payables. Uh, derivatives, I will tell you later on. Accruals are the expenses which be, which have accrued. There's a word in English called accrued. Accrued means it has taken place but not paid yet. For example, the rent for this month has accrued, but you haven't paid. You have an employee, his wages have accrued because he worked for you and he deserves wages, you haven't paid. So the accruals mean there have been some expenses which are legitimately should be paid, uh, but you haven't paid it yet. Lease liabilities are that, there are some assets which you haven't bought, but you all have taken on rent. You hired and you haven't paid them yet. Like for example, when you take an apartment on rent, uh, you don't buy the apartment, you take it on lease. It means you rent out and you haven't paid the rent yet. Same way, BP or the big companies, they don't buy all the assets. Sometimes they take an asset on rent. Okay, for example, uh, BP starts its operations in Malaysia. Uh, they want to have a new, its own oil rig and its own buildings and everything. Um, BP needs uh, vehicles, 
uh, but it needs too many vehicles. I mean, hundreds of vehicles it needs, but it can't buy all of them straight away. And then it enters a contract with a transport company in Malaysia. Can I hire your trucks and the lorries? And they make a contract, they make an agreement, but they haven't paid them rent yet. Of course, it's a liability. The question is, is it a short-term liability or is it a long-term liability? If BP make an agreement that, okay, I, would, I take your service, but I, would pay, I will pay you after one year, then that become the same lease liability become the non-current liability. But if the deal is that they would pay within a year, then it become a current liability. Uh, and then we have the finance debt. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. The money which you have uh, borrowed from the banks or the people, and you need to pay them. If you need to pay them within a year, then it's a current finance debt or a current debt. And if it is going to be paid after more than a year, then it becomes a long-term finance debt, the non-current finance debt, okay? Um, different companies do use different words for debt. Some companies write exactly uh, finance debt. Some only say debt. Some say borrowings. Uh, some say financial liabilities. Some even say the interest bearing liabilities because debt is the only thing which bears interest. Uh, so make sure that which of these words uh, fit into your company. And if, you, if you're unsure, please contact. And then there is a deferred tax liabilities. Deferred tax liabilities means the, the company also owes some money to tax man, which it has not paid yet. Mm -hmm. uh, deferred tax liabilities mean this money, the company owes to the tax man. Uh, this year's tax payable is this. So it's a current year because it's going to be paid, but haven't paid yet. Uh, there's a word called provisions also. Provisions can be in the current and the non-current uh, liabilities. Provisions are, let me give you an example of provisions, once again in Excel. Provisions are, uh, let me share the spreadsheet with you. Imagine that company's profit Or tax is 100. And the tax the company pays, uh, I hope you can see the spreadsheet, right? Is 20. Then the profit after tax is 80. This profit belongs to shareholders. But what company does, it says that I don't want to distribute all the profits to the shareholders, but just in, because just in case if there's a problem in the future, any emergency, uh, how would I meet it? Like for example, you see that you have the salary, uh, or let's say thousand euros and you spend some 800, you always want to save some money, this saving. And this saving you never spend because you are afraid that, hey, in the future, if there's a problem, if there's a traveling certain thing happening, you know, then I, I would be able to make, I, I would be able to support my situation uh, efficiently if I have some savings. So your profit is 80, but you only share 40 with the customers, uh, with your shareholders. And these remainings you start and transfer to provision. Provision. Provision is some kind of fund you create so that in case there is any emergency in the future, you are able to meet. So provision is that part, which uh, is that part of profit, which is basically not distributed. So this is, uh, this profit, 
uh, you have distributed among the shareholders. So this is the profit distributed among shareholders. But that profit, which is not shared among prof, uh, shareholders, rather you save it uh, so that if there's a problem in the future, any contingency, any emergency, any uh, SOS kind of situation, you are able to fa face that situation efficiently. It's not just for the bad things, but it's also for the good things. In case you want to expand your business in the future, you want to buy a piece of land. In case you want to diversify, in case you want to recruit more people, then there will not be any financial burden. If you have been having provisions for the last many, many, many years, then the accumulated money would be big enough that the company can take a big uh, project without any financial hassle. So these provisions are very important. The question here is, why do, why do we include provisions in the liability side? Because this is a liability, this is a liability. And there are, there are provisions here, and there are provisions here. The reason we include provisions in the liability is that after all, this money belongs to shareholders. Remember, the company is not same as the shareholders. There's a legal difference between the shareholders and the company. Company has its own existence, okay? This is the money. Provision is the money which the company owes to the shareholders. It has not given them because the company is thinking that if we have to develop in the future or if we face some problems in the future, we can make use of the money in the provisions. So in other words, provision is that undistributed profit among the shareholders. But who does this profit belong to? Shareholders. Who is keeping this money? The company. It means this is the money which belongs to shareholders, but the company is owning it. Thus, it become a company's liability towards its shareholders. Okay? Therefore, we keep uh, the provisions in the category of uh, liabilities. Uh, this is the money which belongs to shareholders, but the company has not given them. Uh, but this money, the company is using for less than a year. After a year, the company would give it back to them. And this is the money, uh, 18,000, which the company, which belongs to shareholders. Uh, it has been coming from the provisions, the undistributed profits. Uh, but the company is, is planning to use it for many, many years in the future. Okay. So therefore, uh, this money would be categorized as a non-current liability. So remember the, the current and the non-current thing is very important when you see your financial statements, okay? Uh, yeah, so this, this is some uh, discussion about the liability. Uh, I can take you back to the slides now. Yeah. So my suggestion is that uh, when we meet tomorrow, we will discuss the assets, liabilities. Uh, I'll have a recap, but then I will go further to capital of the company. And then we will do some more. In the first couple of lectures, because uh, I'm not giving you any um, activity yet, uh, I want to discuss more of the theory part uh, in the first four or five lessons so that afterward we have more time to do some practice. But meantime, I would recommend you that you should uh, already have a group if you want to group, have a group uh, and also have some company in mind already. And once you, once you make this decision, whether number one, to work in a group or solo flight, and secondly, which company you plan to work on, then the third thing you should do is that after I approve the company, uh, which you choose, you should start looking at the financial statements of the company as soon as possible. Okay, that's my strong and very sincere 
suggestion to you. And now we finish our meeting and we'll have a meeting tomorrow at four o'clock. And till then, all the best. Of course, if you have any question, you can ask me. Uh, Shah, uh, I have gone through uh, one of the company's income statement. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's not similar to BP and there are some new words. Of course, so should it, we need it, to no, ask no, from... No two company would be similar. That's why I'm saying that get, get familiar to your company. And okay. if you have any problem, you can ask me. Okay. The philosophy, the principles would be similar, but the word, phrases, terms can be different. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, if you want, you can share your uh, income statement with me. If you don't mind, I can, and you can ask me what is missing. Sure. If I stop my, yeah. Now, now if you want, you can share your screen and show to me. All right. So shall I come with my group? Uh, because uh, we have already selected a company is it okay to show it now it's it's up to you if you have no problem in showing now you can show it okay give me one second shall mm -hmm. yeah no let's take your time I shared my screen. Can you see it? I can see it, yeah. Yeah, we so, selected Volkswagen. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, so this is... Yeah, your sales revenue is given. So you have the sales, then you have the cost of sales. Very good. Uh, cost of sale is basically your operating cost or operating expenses. Uh, so, then you have the... Sorry, sorry. No, no. Uh, cost of sale is the actually the material cost. The material cost. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the operating expenses like distrib uh, distributed administration. Your look, uh, shiny. Your manufacturing yes. cost is cost of sales, right? Yes. Manufacturing, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I so haven't gone through it deeply. Okay. No, I can explain it to you right now. Mm -hmm. Cost of sale is the cost of making the machine, uh, making the car. Okay. But the thing is that when the car is ready, how would you make it reach to its clients, the customers? Then you have the distribution expenses, administration expenses, other uh, expenses, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. So when you club this cost, it becomes the operating cost. Yes. So your your operating cost include the manufacturing cost also. So the cost of manuf uh, cost of manufacturing of uh, the cars by Volkswagen is forty nine one four two one four two, right? Yeah. But then you also need the accountants. The and uh, you need to have the distribution network. You need to mm -hmm. have a distributor, the administrators, the lawyers, and all that stuff. So that include the operating expenses. Yes. And when you subtract those expenses also, then the company's operating profit is 16966. Okay. Then the company's operating profit is 16960. Can you see operating result? Um, yeah. Yeah, this is the company's operating profit, yeah. And then you have the uh, interest income and interest expense and other financial thing, then then your 
earnings before or the profit before tax, uh, earnings before tax, the profit before tax uh, is basically the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. 18356. Uh, and then you pay a tax and after tax, after tax, your profit is 14029, which is your final, final profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you recall, we have we had a lot of discussion that what is non-controlling. Uh, non-controlling are those shareholders who have no voting rights, but they get preference when the company gives them share of profit. Mm. But this is a very tiny, tiny fraction. The bulk of the shareholders would be the equity shareholders. Uh, which this 540 and 13346 represent. Yes. Yeah. So I don't think any problem about your, uh, your I think in your company's case, uh, the income statement is very straightforward, very neat and clean. Yeah. Um, I know some companies, especially which are the service providers, uh, they might have very complicated uh, financial statements. But in your case, I think it's like a, it's a clean like a whistle. <laughs> so do we need to consider about this also, Shah? No, 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 no. Okay. Then go to balance sheet straight away. Yeah, we have that also. Yeah. Cash flow will come later. But first, no, uh -huh. before cash flow, it should be. Balance sheet should be a bit up before cash flow, I think. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So you have the non-current assets, which includes uh, intangible, like the, mm -hmm. in, and then you have the property plant, lease. So the lease assets are which it has taken on rent. Uh, yeah. The company has invested. Then there is um, some equity investment also. Uh, then the financial service, well, that is something uh, different. And the other financial assets, other financial assets mean the company make investment in stocks, bonds. Uh, then the receivables it has, yeah. Mm. Uh, these are the people who bought car from Volkswagen and haven't paid them yet. And then, the, then there can be tax receivable also. Tax receivables means uh, the company can claim some money from tax authorities. Okay. And deferred tax assets mean that in the past, it the company got some tax credits from the tax man. Yeah. But the company has not used them yet. Okay. Do you know that when you file the income tax uh, return, you also get some tax credits from the tax authorities? That hey, this money you can cut from tax. This money you can cut from tax. Okay, so you get some tax vouchers from the company, uh, from the tax man. Yeah, okay. and these vouchers you haven't used them yet. Hmm. So because it's a claim, it's the Volkswagen's claim on the tax authorities. Thus, they are the Volkswagen's assets. Okay. And because these, these voucher can last for more than a year, therefore they are included in the non-current assets. Make sense? Yeah. And if you go down to the current assets, uh, well, they are the inventories. We know what is inventory, trade receivables. Uh, people bought cars from Volkswagen, haven't paid them yet. Uh, uh, but uh, this customer would pay within a year. So that is why they're included in the current assets. And then some other assets and tax receivables. Uh, yeah, I look at the marketable securities, 16769. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe Volkswagen have invested in some shares or bonds, uh, which uh, they plan to sell in a year, within a year. And then the uh, Volkswagen also have cash and cash equivalents. So I think you, your company is almost using the same words uh, which the slides have been using. So 
very very clear income statement and balance sheet of your firm yeah but we have only two comparing years is it fine of right of course yeah it's always two years the income statement usually three years usually three years uh -huh. uh, but but the balance sheet is two years but if you want to get the historic data because in your some of your assignment you need five years data uh and if this is 2020 look uh shiny in 2020 you can see 2019 and 18 can you they haven't yet uh, issued they have yeah, okay. the latest one is 20, 2019 sorry yeah it's my fault in 2019 you can see 2019 and 18 right yeah the next you can search on the website uh 2008 17 financial statements yes they have list of 17 yeah. 18 yeah yeah so when you see 2017 you can see 2017 and 16. yes yeah so this way you can have the uh data for different years okay yeah but i think if you if you stick with volkswagen you will have no problem because it's a very very nicely uh explained annual report okay sure all right thank you no problem no problem see you tomorrow sure see you bye does anybody else have any question or anything to ask i think our i'm sorry i think our group will pick a bit later our company and uh, i think we will have some questions to yeah. you about our financial yeah. statement and uh, yeah we can ask you yeah sure 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 yeah thank you very much Shep. see you see you tomorrow see bye. you see you tomorrow bye